Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're going. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you all for joining this session at the, the end of a very, very busy two days, and there's still one more to go. But this session is on flexible assessment for academic credit. And much of, I'm sure, what Phil was talking about for most of the day will be really applicable to this session as well. My name is Deb Blower. I'm co-chair of Kappa's Education and Training Committee, and uh, I'm have been involved in the RPL field for over 30 years, so I'm one of the, the old timers in the field, but uh, still enjoy contributing to all of the new learning that we're all gaining over the last couple of days. I'd like to just take a minute to introduce our panelists today, and then we'll start. I'm also having to be a timekeeper because these people have a lot to share with you. But apparently, I need to make sure they stay on time. So <laughs> I'll, be, um, I'll be trying to uh, make sure that happens so that we can cover off everything. I want to, just in terms of introducing them, I'll introduce, I'll start with Andy here. Many of you may know Andy Brown. Andy is the coordinator of the Transportation Logistics Recognition of Acquired Competencies PLAR services at Champlain College in Montreal. He's been there for 27 years. He started when he was very young. He's <laughs> um, and he, uh, he's currently researching some factors that aid and inhibit the non-traditional students' retention and progress in Champlain's PLAR process. He's implemented the use of a learning management system using formative and summative assessments and gap-filling strategies. He's at his happiest, I've heard, when he's supporting and guiding students and content specialists who make up the transportation and logistics PLAR services. So welcome, Andy. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Next to Andy is Kate Obradovich. Many of you will recognize Kate as one of our Kapla board members, but when she's not with the Kapla board, she works as a facilitator with the Learning Pathways Department at Saskatchewan Polytechnic, which is situated in four main campuses across Saskatchewan. Her role is to provide faculty support and system nudging to establish alternate pathways for completing a credential, including PLAR, transfer credit, articulation agreements for forward credit at the institution. I just love some of those words in that, in that bio, Kate. So thanks, Kate, and welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And next to Kate is Christine Weehack, and many of you will know Christine as well. Christine is the director of PLAR at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, BC. Tom, uh, she's based in the Open Learning Division, and Dr. Weehack heads the Prior Learning International Research Center, which is a group of internationally known scholars in RPL. Her research interests focus on the intersection of the assessment of formal, informal, and non-formal learning. So welcome, Christine. Nice to have you here as part of the panel as well. So this session is about flexible assessment. As many of you know, in 2015, Kapla published a quality manual, the Quality Assurance for Recognition of RPL in Canada. This manual includes nine guiding principles of quality practice, and one of the principles is flexibility. Okay, nine guiding principles of quality RPL. One of the principles, flexible, is highlighted up on the screen, and flexibility is described as an that the assessment methods are time and cost efficient, and that there's a variety of effective assessment options available for the RPL practice. Earlier today, we heard a lot about assessment, and this session is going to talk about some of the flexible ways that assessment is done. The, um, the other principles are also on this slide. Sorry, that's okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go over those principles. They're right there. 
the nine guiding principles. So I've already spoke to what flexible assessment is, so we'll go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you. So as we move through today's discussion, uh, each of the speakers is going to speak on three questions. What does flexible assessment mean in your environment? And they will each be sharing their own environments. Might it differ depending on the purpose and or the program area? What qualifications should an assessor have? And what goes on the student transcript? And as many of you know, this isn't consistent across Canada, what goes on a transcript. So it will be really interesting to hear what each of the um, institutions has to say about that. So I'm going to ask each panel member to spend a few minutes with the first question, what does flexible assessment mean in your environment? So we're going to start with... Andy. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm going to come out here because uh, I'm a teacher originally. Uh, and you don't sit behind desks. You come out and you connect with your audience as much as you possibly can. I'd like to talk about uh, what we do in uh, RPL at Champlain in Montreal and Quebec. Uh, some things to think about. I think that the starting, what is the, the saying, uh, it takes a, a village to, to raise a child, yeah? It takes an RPL team to credential and help our candidates, yeah? It's not something done by individuals, it's done by teams together. And if those teams can be on the same page and work together, then amazing things can happen. I'm incredibly lucky to look, work with a, a great team of, of colleagues that are managing other programs, but the, the subject, subject matter experts or content specialists who are the backbone of the R RPL process and, and have bought into the process and are, are amazing. And I think that's sort of the starting point of assessment. You've got to work with subject matter experts, content specialists, teachers, faculty, whatever you want to call them. People don't know about the content area, the knowledge and skills. But it's sort of a partnership, because sometimes, and I think that's come up a lot, they're maybe not that au fait with best practices in an assessment. Yeah? So working with them, and I, I always think it's co-designing. I bring the, uh, the understanding of the educational evaluation process the assessment process, and they bring all the knowledge about the, the subject matter area, the knowledge of skills, the authenticity. Uh, so I think that's a really important thing in flexibility, and sometimes that gives you very little flexibility. I teach a, a course that evaluates presentation skills. I'm sorry, there's only one way to evaluate that. Present. <laughs> you know? Now, we can be flexible after, after that and how we can actually watch them or observe them presenting. They could have recorded a presentation they did somewhere else and we can just sit and watch that. They could maybe talk through their rationale for why they did things. Uh, we could watch them doing a presentation at distance using technology. Yeah. Or we can actually set something up for them to present in front of a, an audience. Yeah, so the, the sort of conditions and that sort of thing, I'm going to come down, I'm sort of going to be moving around a bit here. What we try and do with every evaluation tool that we design is what's called conditions of recondition. Yeah, and this is part of the RAC process, which is RPL in Quebec, where we, we're trying to give alternative ways that we can evaluate the same thing. You know, could it be done through uh, prior qualifications that we can then give equivalencies or substitutions for? Or could it be done through an interview with somebody? Or is it a paper and pencil test? We're trying to, or is that a combination of all those things? And we try and give the, the actual candidate the choice of how they would like to be evaluated as well. Yeah? So we're at, at, in the design phase, we're trying to develop these different alternatives for flexibility. I think flex, flexibility uh, comes into accessibility as well. It's that, you know, if they're at distance, you know, how can we recognize what they, they already know and can do? Can we use artifacts that they've had in their previous life, or do we have to give them a new evaluation? Does that have to be done in person? Yeah. When can we do it? 
we, we, we do evaluations. Like what, one of my content specialists was emailing me this morning because he's meeting people and evaluating them on a Saturday. We do it on a Sunday. Uh, we give training to a group of uh, Jewish early childish educators because they can't attend training on a Saturday for religious reasons. Uh, you know, trying to get that flexibility. Working at distance with online, uh, online solutions for proctoring and also like surrogate proctors. We go into, you know, partnerships. Please, you know, you're going to insist that you do this, this and this in the evaluation. Okay, you're now the proctoring for us. You're working on, our, on behalf of the college. So those are all some, things, some of the things that, that I think come into flexible assessments. And, and, and the, it's down here, I think, I, I, I'm most interested at many times. That I think what we do is, is even our summative evaluations should be formative. Because the first time round, they might not have the knowledge and skills, but they've got 80% of them. And then we've used the tool as an we know now with the 20% that are missing. Now we need to do the gap filling, the gap training before we can reevaluate them. So I think there was talk about high stakes and low stakes. Sure, they're, they're, if they're summative, they're more high stakes, but they can also be low stakes at the same time. They can be both formative and summative. If they get it first time, they're summative. If they don't get it first time, they're formative. Thank you, okay. Andy. I would didn't even have to. Was I okay there? Call you up. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, that was excellent. I Thank you. I feel it though. I think there was a, <laughs> an interesting, an interesting um, point, Andy, and, and and we'll perhaps talk about it later. But the interesting piece that may be different from some institutions is the opportunity for gap filling. When there's a gap, for that opportunity for gap filling to be done almost right away, and then an, or, you know, then another assessment. That's a, that's excellent. Okay, and our next presenter is Christine. So, Christine, if you wouldn't mind. I think that's not my slide. <laughs> that, that was what I got. Oh, oh, okay. Well, it's my name. I actually had some points. <laughs> is, it the, is it the next one? I don't know. Okay. okay. Anyway, well, it's this always, one? no, it's always fun to ad lib. <laughs> You know, I, I learned recently about chair yoga. How many of you have heard of chair yoga? It's basically what it sounds like doing yoga in a chair. So I think we could have had a session on chair yoga here at Kapla today where people got to move around a little bit. But now I'm, my flexibility is really going to be tested because I don't have my slide. No, it's fine. Um, first of all, our university, Thompson Rivers University, we're out in BC. And we're an unusual institution in the Kepler context for a couple of reasons. Well, three reasons, really. First, we're a university. And many of you who are here are working at community colleges or polytechnics. Um, and the university context does put both um, opportunities and challenges for doing PLAR. Um, second, we're a dual mode institution. So we have a full bricks and mortar face-to-face -face, um, campus that grew out of a community college and a university college. And then we have a full other section that offers full credentials through online learning. So that online context is also unusual. Now, the third thing that really makes us unusual is that we're an open institution. And our uh, flexibility in everything we do is in the bedrock of our institution. When the government of BC created the university, they passed a thing called the TRU Act, and it amalgamated a university college with the BC Open University. And I'd just like to acknowledge Alan Davis, who was at the BC OU University when a lot of our innovative PLAR practices started. So um, our TRU Act says as one of our purposes that we must provide an open learning educational credit bank, quotation marks that you can't see my slide, for students. And then this is a mechanism to make sure that students' previous learning of all kinds is recognized to the max. So we have very generous transfer credit opportunities, very low residency requirements, and then we have our PLAR department that allows non-formal and informal learning to be recognized. 
um, in our, our policy, we have uh, also flexibility embedded in it. Our policy, this is again a quote, methods should be selected to suit the unique needs of the particular situation. So we have a formal policy that says you should be flexible. And uh, our policy references the usual suspects, portfolio, challenge exams, demonstrations, interviews, allows them to be combined, allows other methods, if you can think of them, to be used. So that allows us to be very, very flexible. But what I have found in practice is that we do have a constraint embedded in our policy, PAR policy, but it was inadvertent. And this is the constraint, is that we have to use content specialists to do the assessment. Now that sounds innocuous. It sounds like it's in line with the KL principles, the Kapla principles, you know, content experts do the assessing. But what we're finding, I have a colleague, Dr. Judy Harris, some of you may have heard of her, and she's been doing research in South Africa and also at TRU on disciplinary differences and how that affects assessment practices, PLAR, PLAR practices. And what we find is that some content experts are very flexible and others are very rigid. So at our institution, we have a journalism program, very flexible, wide open. They just awarded credit for 13 journalism courses to one student <laughs> based on a professional portfolio. Okay, so he didn't have to do a course by course portfolio. It was a global assessment, 13 credits, a year off his degree, and he's a very happy camper. In our finance and accounting department, no, 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 <laughs> challenge exams only, because that's what accountants and finance managers do. That's how they test within their discipline. So in our job in the PLAR department, where we're, we're working with the assessors to bring them along <laughs> an understanding about what authentic assessment can be, um, it's hard to nudge them. Like, I'm not confident that I will ever nudge the accountants. <laughs> They, they are really determined to stick with their challenge exams. But I have found that there are people, you can find people within um, either a flexible discipline or you can find people even within an inflexible discipline who are willing to try to be flexible. They've done their chair yoga, they're willing to try. So, for example, in nursing, highly regulated uh, profession, very hard to plot, based in science, which has very strong, what Judy calls, knowledge boundaries, really hard for students to plar those courses. But there's one uh, instructor who's a plar champion. She's an advocate. And she teaches a course on community nursing. And she provides a, an alternate pedagogy or a specialized pedagogy for mature students that allows them to plar that course based on their experience. So even within what could be a really rigid field of study, you can find those chances. And so that's really what I would like to leave you with is don't try to get it institution-wide. Look for the disciplines that are likely to be more flexible. You can read Judy's research. She'll give you some clues to what those are. But, and then look for the flexible individuals within, within more rigid fields of study. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Going with the believers. Kate. Thank you. So a little bit of background. Um, all Saskatchewan Polytechnic programs are occupationally focused so at the certificate diploma or applied degree level. Um, and assessment, uh, the pro courses and programs, and then the assessment is based on defined learning outcomes and performance criteria, which speaks to the consistency, the validity, and the rigor. Assessors uh, are the faculty and they are qualified, fully qualified in their occupational field um, or academic subject and again that strengthens validity and rigor. Um, open access, the, our, the, the public has open access to information prior to registering for PLAR so they have the opportunity to look at the course learning outcomes, um, to do a self-assessment, a self-rating scale to look up the costs, um, to see what the process is like, and that varies, uh, as well as the eligibility criteria varies with the program. Um, and then they look at the assessment methods as well. 
Um, and there is some flexibility in assessment methods. And all of that information strengthens the transparency and the respectfulness for, for students, for candidates. Uh, the PLAR assessment is aligned. We've been doing PLAR at South Polytech for at least 20 years. Um, and it, so it is aligned with institutional policies and procedures. And um, it, the outcomes are subject to appeal. So that makes the fairness part of it. Um, so, you know, basically our faculty have the discretion to assign or negotiate, and it depends on the faculty. Christine was talking about people of different temperaments, alternate methods to best fit. First of all, the domain, of course. Is it knowledge? Is it performance? Is it skills? And the level of, of uh, um, Bloom's taxonomy. But then they can uh, have flexibility in the kind of evidence that, that candidates might provide depending on what is their best evidence to demonstrate maths or meeting the learning outcomes. So, of course, what evidence they can submit sometimes depends on their situation. For example, if they are currently working, then in the field and in a, in a well-equipped, et cetera, um, uh, setting, then their work samples or they might do an on-site demonstration we have one program where the program head actually goes out to the work site, I'm talking about continuing care education, um, to observe the uh, candidate in their field, which is great because if you're observing uh, you know, ability to build relationships with, with uh, their patients or their clients, you need to see that in action. You can't do a simulation of that particularly. On the other hand, and also if they're employed, then perhaps employer verifications um, would be useful. But if they were previously employed in the field and now they're working somewhere else and want to get back, then perhaps verifications from prior employers, perhaps some training documentation. Um, and often if a, people submit a, what I call work samples as evidence file, some might call it a portfolio, then there could be a structured interview which also not only elaborates on the evidence, but also provides an opportunity to validate that this actually came, is authentic, it came from the candidate. Um, and then we do have an opportunity as well. Uh, uh, some of our programs use assignments and exams. And again, like Christine had said, it depends on the program and their culture and what they're used to. But for example, if it was foundational chemistry or if it was electrical code, that might be best assessed by an exam. And then, of course, some of the skills or performance, if it's a learning outcome of that nature, you need a demonstration or you need a product. Um, you need performance to be able to rate that. Uh, our institution does offer, some of our programs offer cluster blocks of, of course clusters where people are assessed at the higher advanced level learning outcomes, which tend to cover the, the lower level outcomes. So if you have an introductory course followed by an advanced course, if we assess at the advanced level, we can assume they met the foundational level. And some of our programs offer program level um, so that you can uh, uh, get credit for the entire program. Now, it's, it's a long process and, and typically our programs will ask for multiple modes of evidence and that's helpful because you can look at consistency across evidence. It helps you determine that the work samples are indeed theirs because it's consistent with other evidence that's submitted. Um, authentic evidence is best. Uh, Phil said it. You know, you want to see how they perform in the work site, if at all possible. But there are, of course, cost and time restrictions to doing that. Um, there's more opportunity now with uh, live video streaming to do um, more evidence that's from the work site and we'll hopefully develop that further. And then like all of our programs um, on campus as well with PLAR, there, there is individual accommodation of a verified disability um, is always accommodated and faculty have discretion to accommodate other circumstances. For example, in Saskatchewan, distance is sometimes a barrier that has to be overcome um, should there be alternative methods? Well, you know, sometimes regulatory bodies or the Industry Advisory Council 
We'll put some limitations on what's, what kind of evidence is ex acceptable or how much flexibility is involved, particularly the regulatory bodies. Some faculty prefer a standard approach, and that's easier. It's, uh, it's more practical, uh, and it also depends on how much PLAR that they are doing. Um, so it safeguards, a standard approach can safeguard consistency, reliability, and validity. And typically they include a combination of evidence, although for some programs it's strictly the a final exam. Arts and science instructors tend to prefer the single exam route because that's what they're used to. They're university trained, uh, that's where they come from. Our, our other faculty occup have occupational expertise. They have the advantage of knowing it, knowing what performance is when they see it. Our challenge uh, as facilitators to, is to help them articulate that in the way that Phil showed us how to do. Um, and let's see, balancing, well, to, to ensure consistency and reliability, if you have flexibility, if one person is submitting, um, is, is doing a worksite demonstration, another person is simulated lab, another person is submitting work samples and so on, then we have it, um, assessor guides that have rating scales and um, directions to try and, and, well, to try to uh, strengthen the consistency and reliability of those tools. Um, and that's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Kate, thank you for mentioning um, the individual accommodation. When Phil talked about flexible in his presentation, he was speaking specifically about the types of different accommodations that we make for diverse learners. And some of the exam accommodation may be more time to write the exam or all of the things Phil talked about really fit in under there. Um, that, is a, that is something I think when we look at flexible assessment, we sometimes um, don't think about that as much as we think about the assessment being flexible in terms of perhaps options or opportunities for learners to do it. So it was great to see that that's, um, that's included. I remember a number of years ago having a student do an RPL and um, the question from the faculty was, well, would, did they get exam accommodation? Um, because they, you know, they definitely needed it and they had a proven um, uh, challenge that required exam accommodation. And so even if that isn't written into your policy, it, then faculty question whether that is something that also happens with RPL students. So. Um, Appreciate you mentioning that from a one personal the, perspective. One of the principles of a fair assessment, no matter what type of, or what, for what purpose, is you want to give the candidate the best conditions for peak performance to demonstrate their knowledge and skills. So that's why you need some type of individual flexibility, while at the same time ensuring some consistency. So these presenters have just been so amazing keeping to, <laughs> to our timelines. We have a couple of minutes for questions then we're going to go on to another question, and then we may have time at the end. So, Minette, you have a question? Kate, you talked about accommodating participants. Do you have examples of how you've done that? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways. So, for example, if you have a student who's in the program head who drives all over Saskatchewan, actually, there's three program heads, so we're situated in various campuses, and they will go to the community where a person works. Um, you can imagine the cost for that assessment is expensive, but it's worthwhile for people who are already working in the field and need the credential, they're conditionally employed, they need the credential to keep their job, and often it's the employer who pays the fee for that. Okay, so you would have a range of assessment costs based on what the criteria was? Our, our assessments reflect the time um, involved for the faculty. Is, is basic the basic guideline yes and we're encouraging faculty now to consider the time that they do doing uh, screening and pre-assessment because many of them do that on the side of their desk our success rate is astronomical it's somewhere in the 90s and that is because many programs want to ensure that the candidate is prepared for success um, we don't have it formally in our policy that people have that they do gap filling but they do it anyway. So perhaps we need a policy change there. 
Thanks for that question, Minette. Anybody else have one quick question? Yes. Can I just can I just repeat the question so we get it on the tape? Um, the question is about whether you do assessments with the learning management systems. Yes, partially. What we do is uh, this is learning management systems are particularly good for giving automated feedback uh, for basically anything you can narrow down to a yes no number some sort of factual answer that will never change. So I use it for math and I use it for accounting. Yes, yeah, so they could, they've got, it's, it can be, it, it's within the transportation logistics, it's the accounting. Uh, and, and once you can get, so it, it, it can be complex conceptual knowledge, but it needs to be conceptual procedural knowledge that gives a very precise answer that doesn't change if they get it right. That allows the computer to give them automated feedback when they get it wrong to repair and gap fill, but also allows them to do know when they've got it right as well to confirm to confirm their knowledge. And the way we split it up is that we have in a competency there's elements and they need to get sixty percent or above in each of the elements, and we've split it up. Forty percent of the evaluation for the other element is formative. That's done on the learning management system, and they can do that as many times as they want. Yeah, so you've got people that have got 98% and they're going, no, I want to go in there and get 100%. Yeah? And the, the reason I chose this, because it's conceptual procedural. So procedural practice. Practice is the learning. That's the thing that pushes and pushes the learning process, and that's, uh, so they get success. 40% of it is formative, and then the sum of it is, it's, it is done under controlled paper and pencil, but once they've finished it, they can put it directly into the computer, just enter, and they get their results straight away. Does that, does that answer your question? Just, uh, just as a point on that, I haven't quite got the data yet, but I think our re-evaluation rate has probably gone from about 40% down to probably less than 5% by using that. Thank so. you. Thank you, Andy. Okay. We're on next for the next question. But so you have some idea of how flexible assessment is done in three institutions, the transparency, the guides, the resources, tools, the rubrics, the criteria for, for good assessment. So our next question deals with what kind of qualifications that an assessor should have. And you, if you're familiar, I'm sure you're all familiar with the um, CAPLAS 9 principles. And one of the principles is pre professionally supported in that all staff in the RPL service receive initial and ongoing training for their RPL function. So there's a question here, what qualifications should, have, um, should an assessor have? And I'm going to ask each, um, each uh, speaker to speak on the qualifications for assessor, what they think they should have, and if there's any training, and if they offer the training on an optional basis. So who would like to start? Christine, thanks. No, I don't have that much to say. Um, I mentioned previously uh, that, oh, of course, the train uh, assessors have to be content experts. Um, and in terms of training, uh, back in the mid-90s when the province of BC introduced PLAR across the community college system, they actually developed a complete curriculum to train PLAR assessors. And it... Uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say it crashed, I think you'd have to say it just kind of sank. And part of the reason was because, and the community college system at the time, we didn't have mature students. <laughs> BC was crammed, their institutions were crammed with 18 to 22 year olds who didn't have particularly prior learning to be assessed. And therefore this bold initiative, this bold vision of training every instructor throughout the community college system in how to do floor assessments, most of them thought it was unnecessary. And the training program was also extremely long. And when you have a content expert who has already spent maybe 10 years in university acquiring their PhD, they're not interested in spending another 35 hours or longer to acquire floor assessment. So what I have worked on, I mean, that's maybe a bit heretical, but that's essentially the situation in our institution. What I have worked on, some of them did have that floor training already when I arrived, 
And what I work on a lot is using mentoring to train flower assessors. That's the way, from my experience, my personal experience in teaching, is how people who instruct learn to assess. They work with their colleagues, they model people who taught the course before, they might work with the teaching and learning centers now, but basically it's a peer-driven model of assessment. And so if you can um, find those PLAR champions that I mentioned and help uh, recruit them to help you train other assessors, it's likely to be more, I think, more effective than actually having a formal training. The other uh, constraint in our institution is that there's many, many, many of our courses are never PLAR. They're university level courses, um, particularly at the third and fourth level, very abstract. They're never PLAR. And so to try to provide institution-wide PLAR training to people who are never going to see a PLAR candidate is, uh, is a non-starter. So again, focusing on providing individualized training, coaching, mentoring is the route that we've chosen to go. Thanks. Kate? We had a similar history to that, but the world has changed, and particularly we have a lot of new Canadians now who do have uh, expertise and are looking for ways to have that recognized. And of course, many people, they are they're juggling career change throughout their lives, and they need new credentials, they need prior learning recognized, and people shop now. Uh, for a program that offers recognition of prior learning. So it's become essential to, more essential to meet that need. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, SUS Polytech introduced a faculty certificate program that all new faculty were required to complete. Um, and of course they can plot it. And uh, it includes a, a course on assessment. As well, the way programs are, are developed, programs and courses are developed, there are program developers and instructional designers who work with faculty to design the curriculum and the assessment for the curriculum. What we're trying to do is get them to include PLAR assessment at that point so that it's not an after, an add-on at, at, uh, at a later time when it becomes in demand. Um, as well, you know, our own, we have an instructional leadership development center it, at every campus where they put on um, lunch hour workshops and they will work one-to-one -one with faculty to fill gaps in expertise. And of course, as PLAR facilitators, facilitators we work with faculty. Uh, when programs are revised or changed, we review the candidate guide and, and hopefully, if they let us, the assessment guide and their assessment methods, and it's a time to analyze what they're doing and make some critical uh, positive suggestions about change. Um, you know, CAPLA has inspired the urge to become more rigorous, I guess, and, and more structured and, and make sure our systems work well. And we have recognized a need to do more assessment training for faculty because assessment applies whether you're doing it for on-campus students or PLAR or distance education. How long have we got? How long did we just... Oh, two minutes. Oh, two minutes, okay. Uh, I think what qualities do they need? Openness. I think openness is probably the most important quality an assessor needs. Uh, I I'm completely agree with, with Christine. Uh, there's, there's a concept in transportation logistics, or maybe it's manufacturing, called JIT, just in time. Yeah, and I think it should be JIT with two T's. It should be just-in-time training. Yeah. Uh, there's no point in giving people training if they're not going to then take that knowledge, those knowledge and skills and apply them straight away. Yeah. So you've got to look for openings. You've got to look for a need. And then, and then you've got to start working with people. And, and uh, it's all about relationships. It's about creating a relationship with, with, with an assessor that's built on mutual respect and trust where people start relying on each other's strengths and talents so that people start being becoming open uh, and listening to each other so that they can design they can combine those two areas of expertise to find something that's authentic and useful and, and flexible for for the candidate uh, for the ca candidate success so yeah, I think trust and openness, I think, are the two things I think are most important. Okay. I'd, I'd add confidence. 
um, just confidence that they do know their field and they do know it when they see it and we can we and others can help them structure that in a way that that they feel confident to do it actually I think that has to do with Another aspect of confidence is that at the PAR people's job is to give them confidence in, their, in the assessment methods because mm -hmm. usually when I start working with a new faculty member, they want to over-assess. They want to uh, subject the PLAR candidate to even more assessment than they do with students who are taking the course and to get them to see that, you know, the difference between formative and summative assessment and to design a summative assessment, which could have supplements to become a formative assessment, but to get them to, to design a formative assessment that's time effective for students. They need input from PLAR people to gain the confidence that that method will actually assess the learning. And uh, I've had to do that a lot. Thanks. Um, interesting to, to see the emphasis on the, the, the mentorship and the peer, you know, the peer support, and then the role of the PLAR or RPL facilitator whatever that position is called within the organization. If some of you are may be familiar with the capital competencies that relate to advising, assessing, and the facilitating systems, and there is in there something about that's specific to that individuals who work in RPL do have some type of training. How that training is done can be through a number of different ways, you know, as, as, as you've mentioned. And the just-in-time piece is really important when you're dealing with a group of faculty who, who have a program that you know has many people who are interested in doing RPL for. So thanks very much for that. We're going to move. Uh, we have, I'm right on time here. We have about 10 more minutes. See my timekeeper at the back there. <laughs> so, so the next question is, a question that has baffled institutions about PLAR for many, many years. It's what do you put on the student transcript? When you think about capitalist principles around respect and fair and valid, what goes on the student transcript in terms of PLAR? So across Canada, there have been some different initiatives about what goes on a transcript. So the question is, what goes on the student transcript? If the student, I'm just going to ask you to speak to if the student is successful in the PLAR. And if there is anything that is noted, if there's an unsuccessful PLAR. So who wants to start? Kate? I, I can start with Kate. that. If successful um, in the PLAR assessment, then CR goes on the transcript, and that's the code for credit. If they are unsuccessful, there is no entry on the transcript whatsoever. Now, we're starting to recognize and talk about uh, the disadvantages of the CR instead of a grade, because it disadvantages people for scholarship applications and even for program progression. Because it, in order to progress to the next term, you have to maintain a certain average and CR isn't counted into the average. So if you've just plarred the first term by plar, you have a problem. Um, so, and it's a difficult issue because, uh, you know, there's a, a, the traditional perspective has been plar uh, assesses and confirms the minimal acceptable competence level um, and that it's not necessary to have anything other than a pass but on the other hand there are some disadvantages thanks Kate a Andy Christy yes uh, a, a percentage goes on their transcript when they're uh, successful uh, exactly exactly the same there's no note of PLA at all it's just exactly the same transcript and diploma as somebody that went through a, a, a one-year, say, a one-year program taught course. It's exactly the same. There's no, there's no mention of it at all. And, and uh, personally, I think that's how it should be. I mean, it's two ways to assess exactly the same thing, if we're going for a specific government qualification. 
students. So just to, so are you saying that you've assessed the learning to the outcomes or the competencies of the program? Correct. So the, the, cha the difference is that that student learned it in a different way from someone who took it perhaps online or on site. But the way they learned it, you've been able to assess them at a level that you are able to, you know, confidently say sure. that they have. You know, can, you, can you say whether these two dangerous goods can be transported in the same 53-foot trailer? Well, there's regulations for that, and to do that, you need to be able to use the Transport Canada website, and you can have learned that through your work experience. So is that the policy all over Quebec? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. John, I, 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 uh, I am going to get to you. And, and if it's unsuccessful, nothing's on the transcript okay. until they are successful. Okay. Yippee! You got it. Wow. <laughs> Christine, could we have... John can ask his question first. Well, you, don't mind. So you don't have any information on the transcript, right? I assume you have a record somewhere because what we experience is that people like to shop. They'll do a prior assessment, not like what they hear, and come back in a year or two and apply again, expecting a different outcome. So we have all the documentation that we can compare and make sure that you know the outcome is the same or the documents are the same. So, so I'm just asking you, like, what kind of records you keep on your candidates over time so that if they do reapply, the outcome is, I mean, if they reply with new material, it's different, but if they just apply again because they didn't like what they heard, do you have a mechanism for preventing sure. that? Can I, can I, sure. I mean, I, to become accepted into the PLA process in Quebec, you have to go through a lengthy self and subject matter expert validation process to see if this process will work for you. Yeah? If this is all the things you need to know and be able to do from a qualification, if you know this much, PLA's not going to work for you. Yeah? But if you're up here, then it probably will do. Yeah? If you're up here, brilliant, bring it on. Come on down. Yeah? So there's an intricate and, and a formalized process for first self-evaluation. Tell us what you already know. And there's even pre-screening before that. And then a, a formal validation interview where you said you know this, this, and this. We're going to check that and also try and draw out more things that you, d you didn't know that you knew. <laughs> when I came to Plyer, left and came back two years later, uh, you just plug and get from the beginning, and they could theoretically get through if the assessments changed in any way. Like if the assessors were different or something. Oh, no, no. I mean, obviously there's government records that they've already got that qualification. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, uh, uh, Kate, uh, Sorry. you can talk. Do you want to speak to this as well sure. within we the system? A uh, computer record system yeah. called yeah. Banner. Yeah. And you cannot, uh, the way our policy works, you cannot register for the PLAR section of a course twice, only once, which is why many of our program heads do that gap filling on the side of their desk, yes. Thank you. Sure. Christine? Um, well, actually, I've never run into the problem you um, suggest, and if we did, what would we do? We do, like the others, we have a S grade for PLAR, on the transcript, but if it's an unsuccessful attempt, there's no record. So if somebody did come back, we would, uh, we, within the PLAR department, maintain ex extensive records on the candidates. And I think our deterrent would be the fee, <laughs> that we would um, do a pre-assessment, we always do a pre-assessment, and if somebody came back in two years and said, I want to try it again, what we would do is say, well, show us how you've acquired additional learning since the last time. And they would be, uh, they would have to demonstrate that because PLAR is a privilege, not a right within, they, they can't assert that they can have PLAR. So we do have ways to deter them, but really if somebody wanted to do it and they seemed like they had the opportunity to acquire additional learning, we'd let them do it. We just make them pay for it and then they can take, because they can take courses, they can retake courses, yeah. you know, why not retake PLAR? Thanks, Christine. We, ha we do have time for a couple of questions, and Chips had his hand up there, so, or maybe he's just stretched. There you go. Yeah. No, it's on. Have success for the candidate. 
And that's because it may start off as with, we're in a trade context, so it might be somebody who's a trade qualifier who has met some prerequisite and believes they can challenge for certification. So we enter the process of PLAR, and the assessor knows this going in, that if we do discern a skills gap somewhere, it's a training opportunity. Yes. And we tell that person going in, that's what's going to happen. We may start out as a summative assessment, and it may turn into a formative assessment. So they know going in, you can see the person relax when they hear that. Yeah, it's not the end of the road. It's not right the end of the road here. So assessed, yeah. we never have anybody coming back later and trying to fake their way through it because we immediately put them on a track to training yeah. if we see a gap. Good. Thank Just you. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Thanks very much, Chip. And Minette. It was just to your point, um, at Fanshawe, it's written into the policy, uh, at least 12 months would have had to have passed, and the learner would have to demonstrate that further learning had occurred that would earn the, the ability to do a, a PLAR assessment again, and ours is noted as a, a grade on the transcript. So I, I'll just check to see if there are one, if there's one more question, anybody have something that they, Alan? Thanks. I've been to quite a few sessions on things called enhanced transcripts and almost like many portfolios, it's a transcript, but you, you click on and you can go and see the details underlying uh, what was learnt, not just the grade. And we heard at lunchtime people are perhaps ignoring our traditional transcripts and credentials anyway. But if you could actually click on and find out and see evidence for that supports the grade. It would seem to fit perfectly with the documentation of PLAR. I just wondered if anybody is, knows anything more about that these days. Um, we started, uh, started to work on enhanced transcripts at uh, Open Learning, and it would be very easy to attach at least some kinds of floor evidence um, to, the, to a transcript. Certainly a portfolio, the learning outcomes for courses are all available online at TRU anyway. Um, but we had a change in the registrar's office, and I think that project got moved to the back burner. But we had, we actually had, even for non plar students, um, there was a, a push coming out of our teaching and learning center at one time that students would have portfolios, create portfolios for everything. And so the student would maintain control of that, as well as it being eventually linked to the transcript. So I think it's a great idea, but unfortunately it kind of leveled out <laughs> as an idea. Thanks very much. I think time-wise, time um, I have 3.15, and I think our next workshop starts in about 15 minutes. So I think we're going to wind up. I'd like to um, thank our panelists for speaking so eloquently. I was listening and thinking how the approaches in some ways are all similar, but in some ways, depending on the need of the organization, the institution, um, perhaps uh, a, little, a little different. So thank you very much for sharing the work that you've, you've all done. And thank you all for attending. We have one more workshop to go. And so um, thank you <laughs> after a long day. But thank you very much. And uh, safe travels home for those of you that are leaving.